Um, thanks, um, uh, Tom, and thanks very much, uh, D Dan and Christina, because I think the, the pieces of work you've done are very good. They're they're excellent, and it's it's really important we try and pull some of these issues together because. W for those of you in the, the DRM world, and me particularly in the resilience adaptation world, I mean, what, what I constantly see is lots and lots of reports written by the public sector. And uh, in those reports, there'll be three or four pages that talk about the private sector. And of course, the private sector, I'm not quite sure what that actually is, because it's not a homogeneous group. It's everything from the, the, the farmer, a subsistence farmer selling surplus crop in the local market all the way to the the biggest conglomerates in the world uh, so it's, it's a very very big term the private sector um, but but to me I think we just need to just a little bit step back and think about what this actually all is because when we think about uh, developing countries and we think about developed countries as well it's not it's not we're, we're not isolated from this we're we're in a global economy. 90% of the people in developing countries are completely dependent on the private sector for their incomes. You know, it's a very much, we live in a private sector world. And 80% of all the investments in the world are through via the private sector. And I was reading a report the other day was suggesting 75% of all the, the global climate finance flows are private sector linked. So th the issue is the private sector. And I feel that the the context in which we're discussing disaster risk management and adaptation resilience has been very much from a public s sector perspective without thinking how does the private sector really take part in this. Uh, and the issue for me is actually the private sector is a massive untapped opportunity to build resilience and to, to look at disaster risk management because it's through the private sector that most people's goods and services are provided. I think the, the, so the key to me, and I think the, the, where these reports really score highly for me is on mobilization. What we have to do is try and mobilize the private sector. And that mo and I'm, us I'm using this term now, um, but we, we have to mobilize it both back at down at the community level and all the way up through to corporates. And I'd, I'd really like to see us, instead of thinking about, you know, for example, who's the most important ministries in a government to talk to, it's actually finance. That is finance, finance, finance. Because if you don't have the finance ministries on side, you're not getting the prime minister and president on side, and you don't actually get change in government. So we really have to start, I think, thinking a bit differently about how we tackle some of these approaches. Um, I think another field for me, and, and I was pleased that particularly Dan and Christina picked this up, is the use of language. Um, we work with all all scales of the private sector. And if you talk about um, adaptation, disaster risk, um, resilience, you often get, just get blank faces. And we did a piece of work asking uh, companies what they were doing on adaptation, and we got the answer, nothing. So we asked them, what are you doing about managing water stress? And we got loads of answers. So if you change the language and use the language they use, suddenly you get a different perspective of what their issues are and how they're tackling them. But when we're talking to the private sector, and again, it doesn't matter whether you're the farmer or the corporate, the language they deal with is, is rate of return and value and yield and profitability. Now, even if you're the subsistence farmer, you're still talking about how much income do I earn extra so I can send my kids to school. So we have to, I think, flip the language around and talk the same language. Otherwise, you don't get engaged. I think some of the opportunities we can see in this, and there are opportunities both for the private sector to invest, but also opportunities in terms of uh, building resilience, are absolutely enormous. And I do feel that the, the, the studies we've seen so far, particularly on the cost side, have, I believe, completely underestimated the scale of the problem. Most of the cost uh, work is very much about extreme event, so it doesn't pick up incremental changes and they're just as damaging. Um, and also when you talk about extreme, extreme event, it very much picks up first order impact cost, not secondary and tertiary, and doesn't look at what happens 10 years down the line from, for example, in, in Grenada following uh, Hurricane Ivan in 2004, when Grenada's economy was wiped out and is still wiped out because of that event. Um, 
But when we talk about opportunity, I think there's some exciting things there, and it's about using exciting language to get the private sector involved. And I'm not trying to plug some work we're doing, but I think it's quite interesting. We, we just did some work for International Finance Corporation, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, looking at a market survey in Turkey. And we were, we were really look, asked to look at that work in the context of what were the opportunities for those two banks in terms of lending opportunities. <coughs> and we looked across various sectors in uh, Turkey with the corporations <coughs> of the various private sector organisations. And in three sectors, <coughs> agriculture, agribusiness, and a, and a sort of a loose building construction sector, we came up with $22 billion dollars of investment opportunity on resilience building over a not very long period, it would vary according to which sector you're in. But there's some interesting figures there. I mean, first of all, that's a massive figure in one country for investment potential. Um, and we came up with a figure, I think, of $234 million annually in terms of drought resistant seeds. Now, you scale that up across the world and start to think about what does that mean to the private sector in terms of opportunity. And I think that's what we have to do. We have to flip this around, not just to talk about the risk, because everybody's risk is somebody else's opportunity. Uh, that's a fact of life. And I think that's the sort of thing we, we, we need to start thinking about. Um, I think the other thing is we just need to perhaps just step back a little bit sometimes and think about a lot of the challenges that countries face uh, in, uh, in building in, in their disaster risk management programs and in building adaptation resilience and enabling the private sector because 90% of the, their country is focused on the sector for, the, for its income. It's, we do have to look at the macroeconomics here. And I'll just give you a, an, an example. Um, we did some work uh, in the Caribbean which was funded via DFID through CDKN. And we were looking at uh, an implementation plan of a, a Caribbean regional strategy on climate change resilience. And one of the things we started to realize was uh, the, the high indebtedness of these countries was a real strangle on those countries in terms of going forward. It actually increased their vulnerability because they weren't able to invest. It also meant they weren't able to attract investment to their countries because they were seen as highly indebted. Um, there were governance issues. So all those sorts of issues we know exist actually stopped investment coming into those countries. But critically, we began to realize that what we have to do is, again, flip this on its head. We realized that uh, the high unit cost of production in the Caribbean, some of the highest electricity costs in the world because it's dependent on fossil fuels, and the reason it's dependent on fossil fuels is because of public sector policy and legislation, it can't go down a, a, a renewables uh, route for some countries. That was spending so much of their GDP in terms of foreign exchange. And every time fossil fuel price went up, their economy suffered. And we were saying the critical thing for some of those countries is to engage the private sector so that you come off a fossil fuel economy, you start to produce indigenous sources of supply to create the fiscal space so that you can invest and you come off of this high indebtedness route. So if we're looking at the private sector and <coughs> um, disaster risk management and we're looking at adaptation resilience, we also have to factor in this wider uh, macroeconomic issue. And again, that comes very much back to the developed countries and the role their ministries of finance and treasury and their political uh, policies take because they are pretty critical in some of these countries. John, thank you very much. Um, okay, let's throw this open. We've got about 15 minutes left to, to run. Um, in asking a question, uh, please would you say who you are and kind of where you come from, um, but also I'd like to encourage us to think harder about the Hyogo Framework for Action and the next uh, agreement in 2015 and what could go in that agreement, an international agreement that could help to unlock some of these issues. Um, just a couple of words. I was I was struck by a kind of statistic I heard the other day that said that 80% of the world's infrastructure is still to be built, mm -hmm. and um, you know 90 odd percent of that will be built by you know the private sector, and that could either increase risk or decrease risk. Uh, and was also in Kenya last week, sat on a round table discussing this very issue with groups of kind of private sector actors who actually turned around and said, "Well, I, 
I would invest in this country. Mm. Uh, and they said, well, why wouldn't you invest in it? Well, there's a kind of corruption thing. You know, mm. we just have this thing all over the news. Uh, you know, the railway's costing three times as much as it should do. You know, one for you, one for the railway, and one for the government type thing. And they say that actually, you know, this macroeconomic picture uh, is really important. Um, and then had breakfast the next day, and there's a guy opposite me I'd not seen before, and I said, what kind of business do you work in? He said, oh, well, actually, I'm a kind of commercial seed uh, marketer. And I said, well, you know, how do you experience kind of climate change? Well, climate change, wonderful business opportunity for us. And so you've got these kind of multiple kind of messages kind of coming in. Mm. And some way, you know, I just think that we haven't quite reached the kind of silver bullet somehow. Maybe there isn't one silver bullet. Um, okay, so open for questions, comments, uh, target them to anybody on the panel.